free a sandwich luncheon afterwards with plenty of tables uh, in the coffee house, in the foyer, and all throughout the area so that you can have something to eat. If you need childcare so that you'll be able to attend, um, please speak to David and Diane Guider, but after they've had an opportunity to eat so that they can make, keep an eye on your kids. Um, oh, an announcement when you're done. Oh, Wendell does? Okay, fantastic. So that is the big thing. Please make sure you attend that. Additionally, I had a couple of ones that were specifically requested for me to talk about. Uh, Mark Johnson wants everyone to know that they are starting a pickleball uh, thing here at the church for those of you who are interested in that. So if you'd like to come tonight to the church to play pickleball, you can talk to Mark Johnson or Karen Alwyn. They're very excited about that. Next Sunday, November the 5th, is the Baptism Sunday. We're very excited about that as well. So uh, there's still enough time for someone to squeeze in if they would like to. But again, if you realize that this time has come and gone, we will fill the tank again for even one person. So don't worry about it. Make sure to speak to me, Pastor Ethan, or any of the elders if that's something that you think is important. Operation Christmas Child is beginning because we are coming close to that time. Uh, the date collection end for that is November 12th, so that's two Sundays, I believe. So if you want to do Operation Christmas Child again this year, make sure you pick your box up on the way out. That'll be on the information desk. Feel free to grab it. And people have been asking about Sight and Sound. When we're going to do Sight and Sound again, the NOAA was very well attended. Everybody really enjoyed it. Well, on the 12th of November at 6 p.m., we will be having a Sight and Sound showing of Joseph, and that will be here at 6 p.m., so same as before. Feel free to bring your friends. Come to attendance. We're really excited about that. I almost forgot the one that involves me. So the directory. <coughs> we're open to pick up stuff for the directory. Today is the first of five Sundays that we will have the opportunity to take photos for people for the directory or just review the information that's in there. So if you want to do that today, don't feel bad. Again, you'll have opportunities in November and December. But if you're waiting for the sandwich line, if it's too long, you can come over to the side, see me and Esmeraldo, and we'll either get your picture taken or you can just review the information that's already in there and check that all off if you want that just ported over to the new one. There was one announcement I meant to get into the bulletin this week, but wasn't able to, and that is um, Diana Bartlett is still looking for someone to help her shovel her driveway during the upcoming winter season, and she is willing to pay for it. Um, so if you know a young person or are a young person or not a young person who would still like that, uh, by all means, talk to, talk to myself or someone in the office, and we'll get you connected with her so that we can make sure that she gets the help that she needs for the Christmas season. Uh, so, Wendell, I believe you would like to come up and speak. Yes, I, I don't know what's happening. Wendell's getting ready. Thank you. Not sure how many know of this, but October typically is Pastor Appreciation Month. And seeing how it's still October, although the last Sunday, uh, we, on behalf of the church family, uh, the leadership want to extend a total appreciation to the two pastors that God has blessed us with. Uh, as, as the church leadership, we, we just feel that God has been so good to us. He's brought us two young men that are really strong biblically, uh, stand firm on the truth of God's word, but also are very caring and compassionate men. And uh, we want to demonstrate our appreciation by offering just these small tokens of appreciation on behalf of, of all of you, because uh, we all benefit from how God has blessed us. So uh, Pastor Alec, Pastor Ethan, if you would uh, just come and uh, on behalf of the church family, thank you so much for your, your faithful ministry and uh, your dedication to to God's work and to this church, so thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so as we uh, uh, step into this next moment, it is box time, which means we will call up our ushers to gather our offering, and we will call up our children. Uh, the children's ministry will be running strong, and the uh, box is going to be a delightful launch for it. It's one of my favorite parts of the morning. You say, what do you mean your favorite parts of the morning? Your preach. I know, right? That's how exciting the box is. The box is more fun. Box more fun. It's on the spot. Maybe we should just preach on the spot, too, see how that goes. So we'll be with you in just a second. We're going to step over here, and we're going to bow our heads and pray for this time of offering and giving. Heavenly Father, we come before you with gratitude in our hearts for what you have provided to us. We acknowledge that all things that we have whether we have worked for them or received them. They are all gifts from you. We pray that we are able to use them well for the sustaining and the growing of our own families, but as we give of our offerings and our tithes today, 
We also pray that it will be used for the growing of your kingdom. We pray that what we are surrendering to you as an appreciation for your provision will be able to spread the gospel far within the city of Woodstock and will be able to allow us to shine bright as a light in the dark corners of the city. We pray for all the programs that we run, all the opportunities that we have, and all the moments of gospel faithfulness that we step into. We pray that you would bless them and allow lives to be changed for, for their salvation and for the glory of your name. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Building microphones today. I'm going to give you this one. Oh my goodness. What do we have today? Ooh. Oh boy. We have a cat princess with ballet slippers. This one's tricky for me. I'm not sure what I'm going to do for this one. Um, Can't even go to the print. Nah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're good. Oh, that's right. You're. Oh, I didn't know that. Come on up. Absolutely. Oh man, that was a save. But I've got one, just so in case you were wondering. Cat princess. So how many of you guys know the, like, cat myth, cats have nine lives, right? It's not true, but they say it. Can you actually imagine how long that span of time would be? How long do cats live, by the way? Those of you who've had cats, what's the longest your cats lived? Thirteen. Yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Anna, cat length of years? Fifteen? Yeah, thirteen, fifteen, somewhere along there. Yeah? 20? Wow. That's amazing. So we'll go with the maximum. Yeah? 14. It's not bigger than 20, but still impressive. Um, so we'll go with the maximum. 20 years. 20 years. So nine. Let's just imagine that this is a cat that is going to live all of its nine lives at 20 years long. So nine times 20 is 180. Does that sound like a long time? roughly long time, 
But there is something even more long-term and amazing waiting for Christians. We might think that 180 years sounds like a long time. But when we come to faith in Christ, we are given the gift of eternal life with our Lord. Which means that when we get to the end of this earthly life and step across the veil and go see our king, we're with him forever. And forever is an awful lot longer than 180 years. In fact, it is time without end. So a lot of, time, a lot of people would probably struggle to imagine a full 180 years off the top, but <clears throat> when we actually think of how long we'll get to spend with our king, it's going to be time without end. And, uh, Vic hey, Victoria, you going to come back and say hi? <laughs> but that is our lesson from our cat today, is that for as long as those quote-unquote nine lives might sound, we have something far better to look forward to, which is a, a, a life of, of relationship with our God and then an eternity with Jesus Christ. So <laughs> that's the box. And thank you for bringing me up a wonderful one. I hope you guys have an excellent time downstairs. Thank you very much. And let's pray for our kids as they go. Lord in heaven, we thank you for these treasures you've given us. We pray that as they head downstairs to learn and grow, that you would bless them and keep them and help their faith uh, to become the faith of a good and faithful servant. We pray for all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with us as we step into a time of worship once more.
be seated. Let's come before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord, we come before you with hearts that are <coughs> glad and joyful for the fellowship that we are able to share together. We thank you for the changing of seasons by which we can see the world move forward in time and, and be blessed in different ways. <coughs> we thank you for all the things that are coming up this fall. We thank you for our opportunity for a baptism Sunday. We thank you for the opportunity for, for um, our various uh, ministries to run programs uh, connected with Christmas. We thank you for the outreaches that are able to start up in this season, and we recognize that all of them are, are, are best served when they are being done purely for the glory of your name. We lift up your name, Lord. We praise you, we honor you, and we ask that all that we do isn't for the attention of ourselves or the, even the name of this church, but simply for the glory of you and your kingdom. Uh, we pray that those that we reach will hear the gospel um, straight and true and be able to understand their need for a savior and salvation. We pray for all of those uh, among us who are in hospital or um, going through uh, difficult uh, medical seasons. We pray for, for Ron and for Mac and for all of those others who are um, heading through various um, uh, medical struggles. We think of Kathy who's going, gone through her surgery and is in recovery, and for all those others who are recovering as well. Lord, we know that our, our bodies need your provision just as much as any other part of our life. We need your healing hand of comfort and support to bind us together and hold us, hold us steady. We thank you for all the years that we are given. We thank you for the opportunity that we do have to live on this world that you created. Even if it's fallen, we see your beauty in all things. And we pray that we are given open eyes to praise you for the wonders of your creation, even as we seek to bring the gospel truth to the world so that I can start to work against the fallenness that we also see. Lord, we pray that when we look into ourselves, we don't look into our hearts with blinded eyes. We pray that we are able to see the ways that we still struggle, the ways that we need to, to grow and change and be convicted in order to become more like Christ. We recognize that it's not a journey that happens in a day, but we pray that the journey does not stop. We pray that we don't become content with simply where we are, but that we constantly look towards the image of Jesus and ask, how can I go one step closer today? We pray for the strength to do that, we pray for the willpower to do that and the desire to do that. We pray that you would draw us into the words that we can be constantly filling our hearts and minds with truth and driving away the, the lies and philosophies of the world to prioritize the truth of the gospel itself. And we pray that as we step out into this world that we will be bright lights for you. Pray that you would help us to not just be dim lights or, or lights that are only mildly different from the people around us, but that we would truly be bright lights for the gospel that would show off just what it means to be saved and redeemed by Christ. Pray that our examples would be powerful ones, and that you would be working through us to convict those around us that they need the same truth that has come to define our lives. We pray for all of these things, knowing that there are many other things in November that can bring us joy and challenge, and we submit all those things before your sovereignty. We trust that as we lift up all these prayers to you, that you will be arranging them to the good of your kingdom and your people, and we trust them to you as your good and faithful servants. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> How did that happen? <laughs> Alec, how, how did that happen? <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> Could it have been the giant Nerf battle that went on yesterday? That's one of the first... I, I remember Nerf battles. I, I feel, feel like I should have been there to partake in this one. I hear it was epic. But I'll, I'll put these right here for now. Delightful reminders of good times. So, we are in Act, of course. We are in Act 16 still. Um, we are actually arriving at the end of Act 16 and this is verses 25 through 40, and it is the part two of a two-parter we've had with uh, Paul and Silas in Philippian prison. Um, as we jump in, it, it is neat to realize that this specific part of Acts is one of the 
better known and most commonly preached sections in Acts. The story of Paul and Silas in Philippian prison has captured Christian hearts and minds for many generations. And I mean, it's not really surprising as to why. In the space of only 15 verses, we get the chance to see God's miraculous intervention in the story of Paul's ministry. We get to watch the gospel redeem yet another Roman official who would have been deemed unreachable. And we get to see two Christian heroes of faith demonstrating a high standard of Christian excellence in a situation where most people would have just ended up terrified. Today we will have an opportunity to touch on all of those pieces, although our greatest attention will be actually focused on the last one. The idea of what it means to be an upstanding hero of faith in Christ. In our modern society, we have become distracted by an obsession with pop culture heroes, as well as the flashy traits they demonstrate. You say the word hero and people automatically start thinking about Superman, Captain America, Spider-Man, All Might, and admittedly beneath all those superpowers and spandex, there, is, there are sometimes virtues and morals worth respecting. The best and most celebrated heroes were made to be vis visual embodiments of Christian virtues after all. However, none of these superheroes, not even the original Superman, who you could argue is the most virtuous, none of them ever really get close to a robust picture of a hero of faith, right? Only by looking in the Holy Scriptures in places like Acts 16 can we paint a portrait of what it means for an everyday Christian to be the good and faithful servants that God has meant for us to be in his kingdom. And only by looking to Christian examples like Paul and Silas, imitators of Christ, can we come to learn what it means to be humble heroes of faith ourselves, who understand the standard of Christian heroism and put it into practice for the glory and fame of our God. So, let's jump into the text. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison, prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Paul said with a cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. You and all your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And he brought them into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let these men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Okay, first attribute of Christian heroism, providing a living testimony. When we check in on Paul and Silas, they are in a Philippian prison, in the innermost cell with their legs bound by sets of restrictive stocks. This is what most people would define as an uncomfortable day. In fact, the only way this situation could have been more uncomfortable is if the guards had been given buckets of tomatoes to throw at Paul and Silas for casual target practice while all this was going on. Very few people would have been excited or enthusiastic about what was happening. And the very last thing you would expect to hear 
singing. However, that is exactly what you hear. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Lifting up their voices, they were offering prayers before God's throne and praising him with their lips. They were satisfied and joyful in the midst of unpleasant circumstances, and they let that joy overflow into a display of gratitude and worship. And to some, that's confusing. What do these men have to be excited about? What about their reality makes this behavior rational? Well, nothing, I suppose. If you look at it from a worldly perspective. If you look at their circumstances, there is nothing that would naturally inspire such obvious joy. Most of the prisoners around Paul and Silas were probably saying and feeling things similar to what you would hear if you grounded a teenager or put a toddler in time out. Bad circumstances leading to bad attitudes. However, Christian joy is not dependent on circumstances. It's dependent on God and his three-in-one triune majesty. From God the Father, the Christian gains confidence of perfect divine sovereignty. They get to live assured that no matter what happens around them, their Holy Father has the story of the world under control and is working things to the good of his kingdom and people. From God the Son, Jesus Christ. A believer has the confidence of their salvation and the promise of eternity. They know with certainty that their sins have been paid and forgiven in full and that their future is secured in Jesus. And then from God the Holy Spirit, the Christian experience is a direct empowerment for joy as the Holy Spirit that lives and works within them personally works to grow spiritual fruit in their life. And as Galatians 5 tells us, one of those fruit is joy. This kind of joy, sourced directly and indirectly from God, is a joy that cannot be overcome, and it's unnatural to the world. The world cannot simply wish this joy into their life without the God from whom it springs. And that's why, when the prisoners hear the prayers and hymns of joy around them, they listen. They listen to Paul and Silas. Drawn by their God-honoring joy and hearing whatever words of gospel truth were contained within their hymns. By the way, it's a good reminder of why we actually need our hymns to be biblically and theologically sound. Now this joy, that would be enough to draw our lesson from right now if that were all we were given. But there is more that we have to work with. And he gives us that extra bit of material through his divine power. Pouring out his miraculous power into the region of Philippi, God causes an earthquake to shake the prison in its surrounding area. Prison doors are thrown open. The stocks fly open. Locks are shattered. And prisoners are freed. All of them. Not just Paul and Silas, but every prisoner. And it seems at first that God intends for a jailbreak, like he did with the Apostle Peter back in Acts chapter 12. Now, admittedly, that would have been pretty good news for Paul and Silas, right? Would have been terrible news for that Philippian jailer, though. As we've talked about in the past, Roman law was pretty strict on jailers, and they were tasked on pain of torment and death to keep their prisons secure. If all the prisoners of the jail escaped at once, that would be a lot to answer for. And while Roman law did have provisions for natural disasters that could have given mercy to this jailer, to lose all of your prisoners at once would probably mean that mercy was a bit of an unlikely event. This man looks out at the prison around him, sees the end of his career and the end of his life in those open doors. And he just decides to cut out the middleman 
and end things immediately by taking his own life. Many people would have just let this defeated man kill himself and take this opportunity to escape. You know people who would do that, don't you? But Paul and Silas are not men of fortune. They're men of God. They saw the value in this jailer's life. They saw the love Christ held for him. And they recognized this moment not as a chance to escape, but as a chance to show Christ-like compassion beyond anything else that this jailer had probably ever experienced in his life. Throwing away their supposed chance to freedom, Paul calls out, do not harm yourself. For we are all here, verse 28. And by God's grace, that compassion breaks through every last barrier that this hardened Roman jailer had in his heart. He recognizes that no prisoner has ever shown him kindness of this degree before. He recognizes that these prisoners, arrested for preaching a public gospel, must serve a Savior that they are willing to imitate faithfully, even if it costs them everything. He recognizes that their God, whoever he is, must be a God truly worthy of following. And that if he wants to, <laughs> he would be powerful enough to get these faithful men out of jail whenever he desires, earthquake or no. And with this, his walls torn down, the jailer asked to be shown the path to salvation. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 30. Friends, what we need to take from this miraculous story of God's power at work is to notice how Paul and Silas are faithfully offering a testimony to Christ even in the moments where they aren't directly speaking the gospel. With every moment of their life, Paul and Silas are crafting a living testimony by which they can display the truth of Jesus Christ using their actions and priorities. When they are restricted and bound by chains, they express the joy of Christ so that those who listen might be able to recognize just how much Christian joy differs from the despair that the world wallows in. When Paul and Silas are given a chance to escape at the cost of another man's life, they decide to show the compassion of Christ and prove the love that God has for every lost soul trapped in sin and darkness. And what's amazing is that God used those living testimonies to soften hearts and minds that would have otherwise been hostile to the truth of Jesus. The prisoners, hardened criminals who watched unimpressive men get led into their neighbor, neighboring cells, they actively listened when Christian joy convicted them. The warden who first locked Paul and Silas in prison falls at their feet and asks to be shown how salvation works when their sacrificial compassion moves him to deeply respect their God. These lost sinners get divinely prepared to hear the verbal gospel of Christ because of the living gospel testimonies that were shown to them when words were not an option. <clears throat> this ability to provide a constant living testimony for the gospel using Christ-like behavior is what is intended by the phrase, preach the gospel at all times, when necessary, use words. This phrase has been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi for a very long time, and whether or not he actually said it, people aren't fully sure. But regardless, it's gotten a bit of a weird reputation in modern times because people use it as an excuse to never speak the gospel at all. Right? They just say, I'm, I'm, I preach, but I don't use my words. St. Francis told me to. However, I, I hope we're all mature enough to recognize that Paul and Silas never once intended to never speak the gospel. They were simply turning the rest of their lives into a living, wordless testimony that would make their spoken gospel testimony more potent. They wanted to live their lives reflect, reflecting Christ fully 
so that they could prepare soft soil for their spoken gospel message. If you wanted to adjust the saying in order to reflect its intent, you could say, preach the gospel at all times with and without using words. And if that's the case, then we have to ask ourselves, how are we doing with that? If our lives can be a living testimony to God's goodness, truth, and light, then what is the story that your life is currently telling? Do people see the joy of Christ in you, regardless of the circumstance that you are in? Do people see Christ's compassion, love, integrity, honesty, morality, and devotion from you? And do they see it in moments when it wouldn't benefit you in the slightest? Do they see something that will convict them that Christ is different and has made you different from the world? Or do they simply see the same thing as themselves? The same weakness, the same emptiness, the same shallowness. To be effective, a living testimony has to truly demonstrate that Jesus Christ and his redeemed saints are so entirely different that nothing but the gospel can explain it. And when your living testimony is so Christ-like as to show that, then you will get to watch in amazement as God uses it to pave the way to truly miraculous gospel moments. Let's talk about a call for true faith from verses 31 through 34. So, if Christian heroism involves providing a living testimony at every moment, then what about the opposite side of the coin? The act of communicating our faith. Well, this comes into focus when we take a look at how Paul uses his witnessing opportunity with this eager Philippian jailer. And what we see is, perhaps surprisingly, one of Paul's shortest gospel presentations that he ever gives. I mean, it's, it's ten words long with a clarifier on the end. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Ten words of salvation truth. And then afterwards, you and your household. Four extra words which clarify that this is not some secret or private knowledge that's only intended for the jailer message of salvation truth for every person that he cares about. Every person that he loves needs to hear it, and hear it they will. Bringing Paul and Silas back to his house, the Philippian jailer makes sure that all the family, staff, and servants of his household have their own personal opportunity to hear the gospel for themselves, to place their faith in Jesus themselves, and to follow their family head willingly into a journey of salvation and discipleship. Every one of them makes that powerful decision. And the reader does get to watch in amazement as the power of the gospel breaks through to yet another, another non-Jewish family with Christ's redeeming truth, making the church of Philippi just that much stronger for the work of ministry ahead. However, while we could focus on the circumstances of that, let's back up a bit and just talk about Paul's message. The actual thing that he says. Whenever you have a short, simple message like this, you as a student of Scripture actually have a, something of tremendous value in front of you. Because what you often get to see is the beating heart of whatever topic you are dealing with reduced down to its bare essentials. And in this case, the topic is true faith. Because Paul gives the saving truth of the gospel in so few words, we get to see what Paul does and does not mean when he calls people to embrace true faith by believing in the Lord Jesus to be saved. First off, let's start on what Paul doesn't mean. We can see in te Paul's ten careful words that Paul does not compromise the significance of faith by adding extra works to the process of salvation. He doesn't take the prime stake of salvation by faith, 
grind it down and then add other junk meats to it like rituals, ceremonies, or formalities until all that's left is a bloated pile of works-based hot dog filling. His simple call for salvation by faith, for belief in the Lord Jesus, it's, it's simple and clean, it's straightforward and direct. No work or deed earns us salvation. No ceremony unlocks salvation. No act of service proves us worthy of Christ's work. There is simply an offer. An offer of salvation and forgiveness put forth by Jesus Christ on the basis of his death and resurrection. And if we put our faith in the giver of that offer, if we put our faith in Jesus, then we will be granted the gift that we do not deserve. The gift of being made right with God through Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. If we want to put a proper theological bow on it, you can say that Paul's simple gospel message reaffirms the sufficiency of faith for salvation in Christ. And it reminds us that we ourselves, in turn, when we communicate the gospel, we have to be determined to uphold that faith is sufficient for salvation. And we have to do it in the midst of a world that tries to prove its own worth using works and publicity stunts. Over while what Paul doesn't mean is important, what Paul does mean is also important. When it comes to faith, we need means that we need to pay extra close attention to the words that Paul chooses to use. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Perhaps the most obvious of these is the name of the Savior himself. Paul, as always, points to Jesus Christ as the one and only path to salvation. Paul is convicted that only Jesus can save a sinner through the sacrificial payment of his blood. And those words echo the words of the Apostle Peter before him. Acts 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's direct and essential. Only Jesus can save. But perhaps less obviously, Paul's careful selection of words shows that while he will not add works to salvation, he also refuses to give any ground on the concept of sincere faith. While unmotivated Christians might lazily portray faith as a simple mental checkbox, Paul refuses to allow faith to be degraded to something as shallow as a yes or no question. Paul is not like the metaphorical shady McDonald's, which will take down something as wondrous as root beer and then water it down until you're left with nothing but a shadow of sugary aftertaste. Paul would want full-bodied root beer, just like he wants full-bodied faith. His use of the Greek word pisteusen, or believe, demands that the faith of the believer reach from the head all the way down to the heart. It requires that our faith be more than just a confirmation that we are factually okay with Jesus. That we believe he existed. It has to be a willing binding of our deepest heartfelt conviction to the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done. And along with that, Paul's use of the, word, of the Lord title for Jesus confirms that our belief of faith must be accompanied by a submission of faith. A submission to Jesus as the one who deserves to steer our life. Head, heart, submission. True, full person faith for uncompromised salvation under an infinitely generous Savior. That's what Paul calls for. And indeed, if you listen to the famous Romans 10, verse 9 through 10, you realize that Paul never stops calling for this full person faith, head, heart, submission. And he does it even when he does have more words to give. 
Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Sounds awfully familiar, huh? Just a long form of what's in this passage. That's because Paul is a true Christian hero who calls boldly for nothing more, but also nothing less than true, full-person faith in Jesus Christ. Church, if we carry the gospel within our hearts and share it faithfully with the world, we should be looking to be heralds of true faith as well, which I'll admit is harder than it sounds. On the one hand, allowing salvation to remain by faith and faith alone, it can often cause us to second-guess if we're actually setting up believers for a life of obedience to Christ. After all, we tell ourselves, if, if we don't bind salvation to works, then who's going to do the works? And on the other hand, you could get a different worry. If I call for full person faith of head, heart, and submission, then isn't that still going to be a demanding standard for the fun and fancy free world that we live in? Think, what about all the free spirits that this full person faith is going to scare away? The answer to both those concerns is that calling for true faith in Jesus will always be the right answer for producing the dedicated Christians that God desires to see. Those whose hearts are ready for salvation, they're not going to shy away from the full person faith that Christ asks for from his disciples in fact, those hearts that have been truly prepared for salvation are going to wish of their own desire that they could give Jesus more for who he is and what he's done. And as for the works that we will not attach to salvation, we see from Paul and Silas' story that they are accounted for as well. Those who truly and fully believe in the Lord Jesus are not only saved but the very nature of their true saving faith drives them towards a life of transformation and change. A life in which they wish to know and obey the Savior. The Philippian and jailer and his family who heard Paul's direct message took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, showing Christ-like compassion. The Philippian jailer was baptized at once, he and all his family, revealing a determination to obey Jesus Christ. The Philippian jailer and his family brought them into his house and set food before them, showing sacrificial generosity. And the Philippian jailer rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God, showing the birth of Christian joy. All that simply came about from a gospel call to true faith. And it came from a gospel messenger who trusted that real, full-person faith in Jesus would lead to everything else that God wanted to see. Friends, may we all strive to be heroes of faith like Paul who recognize where their gospel responsibility truly lies. May we avoid the temptation to call for anything more or anything less than the true, full-person faith that Jesus is longing to see. And may we watch and wonder as God uses that simple, powerful gospel call to save the lost of our world for salvation, service, and relationship with him. Verses 35 through 40 ends with an appeal for a shepherd's heart. One of the best parts of the Christian journey is that you will never thwart God's plan for your future when you act to honor and obey his holy will. Many people in Paul and Silas's shoes would have looked at this earth-shaking opportunity to escape the prison and said, this is it, my only chance. If I don't take this opportunity, if I instead witness to this Roman jailer in front of me, this broken man, and I think God is telling me to, if I step into that opportunity, I'm never going to have another chance like this. I'll be stuck here forever and I'll only have myself to blame. However, that is not how God works. 
He does not taunt his children, trick them. If God wants Paul and Silas to be released from prison, then their selfless gospel-sharing faithfulness is not going to steal away from God his ability to release them. The evidence is laid out directly in Acts in verse 35. After Paul and Silas throw away their chance to escape by preaching faithfully to this jailer, God simply moves other chess pieces around to get them out. With what appears to be a miraculous behind-the-scenes intervention, God prompts the magistrates to reconsider their arrest of Paul and Silas. No official reason is provided to the reader why this is the case, although some reasons do exist. It's just reported to us. And the implication is that God is the ultimate mover and shaker behind this. In response, the magistrates send word to the jailer and ask for Paul and Silas to be sent peacefully out of the city. And that's good news, right? No reason to look twice at this. Yeah? Time for Paul's squad to pack up their bags, praise God for their blessings, and hit the road. Correct? Well, that's the, actually the surprising part of the story. Because Paul doesn't let himself get shuffled out quietly. Paul decides to make the magistrates painfully aware of just how illegally they have handled their Roman authority. As Jews who were also Roman citizens, Paul and Silas were entitled to the legal rights of Roman citizens. They had the right to a fair and orderly trial with formal charges, and they also deserved to have their punishments reserved until after a formal sentence was given. By beating Paul and Silas publicly after a lynch mob trial, the Roman magistrates had been disastrously negligent in upholding the roster of citizens' rights that brought peace and stability to the Roman Empire. If Caesar heard of what they did, losing their jobs would be a near certainty. Say goodbye to that 401k, those generous stock options and that retirement bonus, because these magistrates would be ending their careers early without any kind of golden parachute. With this certain doom hanging over their heads, Paul demands a humiliating alternative to snitching and punishment. He tells the magistrates that they will have to come in person and apologize to him and Silas, and then let Paul's team leave the city on their own schedule after visiting Lydia and the newly founded Philippian church. Paul's team will move on from Philippi, that's for sure, but they're going to do it on their own terms, and the Philippian government will have to admit its mistake. And when you look at this bundle together, it can seem like Paul is being petty rather than grateful to God. I mean, God just got him out of prison scot-free. Now you're looking to cause a scene? Really, Paul? Get that pride under control and move along to the next place God wants you. However, if you, if you slow down and pay attention, you realize that this isn't pride. This isn't a parting shot at a defeated opponent to create pain and emotional damage and boost Paul's ego. Paul has just been involved in planting a new church in a fiercely loyal Roman colony. And the Philippians have proved that they are not delighted to have Christianity moving in. If the people of Philippi come away from this situation with the wrong assumption that they can just wield the Roman justice system whenever they want against the new Christians, consequence-free, then Paul and Silas are not the only people who are going to have to face down a lynch mob trial. In fact, if Philippi gets away with this, with this abuse of Paul and Silas, then this is probably going to become a city tradition. The new Christians of Philippi from day one will have to face an enemy that knows it can get away with government corruption and legal manipulation, and Paul will not be able to be there to protect them. Paul has to move on, right? This causes Paul's shepherd heart to bleed. He looks at these new Christians. He sees that he has one chance to give them whatever protection he can. And he wants to give them everything that he is capable of giving as their teacher and their mentor. Because he knows he has the upper hand this time, as opposed to other situations on his journey where he's sort of on the back foot. 
he puts his foot down. He claims his rights. He demands a reckoning for the injustice against him. Not for his own satisfaction or his own happiness. Not even because he thinks he's going to prevent persecution entirely. Paul knows persecution is going to happen. Paul does it. Because this special chance to create an embarrassing compromise is going to at least make these magistrates think twice before letting the Roman justice system get dragged into future abuses of Christianity. It will make them pause and remember that the last time they let the mob rule them, they almost lost their jobs and possibly even their status as a favored Roman colony. Paul might not be able to stop Philippian persecution entirely, but he can strip, strip away some of the most serious danger and give the new believers he loves the best possible start that he can, along with any final lessons and encouragements that he can provide. Watching this pastoral boldness at play, we can come away from this with a lesson that's relevant for all Christians, but especially for those who have begun to mature in their faith. After the first day that we come to Jesus and start our journey of faith, there will always be those who come along behind us and follow after our lead. There will always be younger and newer believers who we are meant to carefully shepherd as under-shepherds of Jesus Christ. Now, in some cases, this shepherding responsibility is baked in to roles or positions that someone might fulfill. Examples include pastor, elder, deacon, and ministry leaders. However, even a lay Christian, without any title, is meant to offer a shepherding influence to Christians who are younger or weaker than they are. And the question therefore becomes, what are you willing to do to help them? What are you willing to give and show and teach and do for newer Christians who walk the road of faith after you? How will you show a shepherd's heart to them in the midst of their most vulnerable early days? New Christians need building up in their foundational knowledge of the Bible and the church. Will you help to teach them? New believers need help maintaining their courage against the cruelty and rejection of family members and friends who cannot understand their decision. Will you encourage and comfort them? New Christians may find themselves running afoul of workplace regulations or school policies when they start to actually live out their faith. Will you help to defend and support them? New believers will find themselves struggling with self-doubt and feelings of unworthiness regarding the gift of salvation they've received. Will you reassure and support them? New believers will find themselves abandoned or cut off by people they trusted. Will you help provide and care for their needs? Or are you going to leave them alone? Friends, a hero of faith doesn't just feed themselves excuses or justifications as to why new Christians aren't their problem or concern. They have a different heart. A shepherd's heart. A heart that looks out at each person who rocks the road of faith behind you and says, what a gift it is to have that new brother or sister in Christ. What a blessing they are. And what a brave decision that they made to put their faith in Jesus. Whatever they do, whatever I can, whenever I can, I will help faith grow strong and true. If there is anything that I have the strength to do to protect, to encourage, to support, to motivate, to teach, then I will do it for the glory of God's kingdom. God's greatest heroes are heroes who foster a shepherd's heart and remind themselves that new believers are a precious treasure within God's kingdom. Something not to ignore, but to cherish and develop. Faith heroes pour out their talents, their energy, their strength, and their wisdom, whatever they happen to have, and invest it in the next generation of believers so that the 
flame of Christian faith can shine as bright and hot as possible wherever it's lit. That's what we're all meant to be. That's what we're all meant to do. And as we add that shepherd's heart to our living testimony and our call for true faith, we will find that we are increasingly being prepared by God to stand tall as true heroes of faith. Heroes who will be honored and rewarded in the eternal kingdom to come. Church, may we never sell ourselves short by settling for anything less than the lessons we have seen today. Don't accept the lie that just because you're an everyday believer in an everyday town, that you can't be a hero of faith on behalf of your Lord. Be imitators of Paul as he imitates Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Reach for that true heroic standard. And you will be surprised at the heights of Christian heroism that God can bring forth from you. And so let us pray as we close that we can be made into faith heroes together. God, we come before you seeing the full weight of, of what it means to become Christ-like, to become heroes of faith. We pray that we will be able to stand strong in that responsibility, to step forth in faith, to be built and grown so that we can stand tall as examples for others. We do this not for our own glory, but for the glory of your name. And we pray that your name would be lifted high through all the heights that we are able to ch achieve through your strength. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So for those of you who will be joining us for the members meeting, we will be taking about half an hour after service to make sure we have time to have our sandwich lunch, which means that we'll probably start the meeting around 12.30ish. And so as you head out, please enjoy. For those who have children who they would like to um, be able to set up with the nursery, um, that will be open during the members meeting and you can get in touch with the guiders after they've had a chance to eat their sandwiches. <laughs> They'll set you up. And of course, as the rest of you head off into this week, may you go in the power and strength of your Lord. May you go as a light for the gospel and shine bright for the kingdom of truth. Um, I would ask that those who are our baptism candidates for next week, please join me very briefly at the back of the sanctuary, and may the rest of you go in the strength of God. May you go, and may you be blessed. <laughs>